So, a little part of the show we like to call Day Drinking with Ted Trimpa. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite, favorite parts. So, the evil string master of the left, Ted Trimpa, joins us every now and then. Good to see you. Great to see you, John. Happy to be here. Uh, you ruined my state. Um, that's all I have to say. I'm going to flee to Wyoming. Congratulations. You're, no, yep. I'm not. I'm staying. I'm staying. <laughs> Actually, I want to I talk about what's coming up next year because this is a time where people's plans are starting to percolate. Now yep. that the maps are starting to solidify, and perhaps by the time this airs, we'll know where the 8th Congressional District is and where all the Senate seats are, who's in right. and who's out. Um, my prediction, for a vast number of reasons, is that 2022 is going to be a big Republican year, not only nationally, but here in Colorado, as long as Republicans don't screw it up. I think it's all in our playbook. Uh, I actually agree. Um, the thing about Republicans here, though, is you guys go skeet shooting and you stand in a circle. Um, I, I do think, though, that what, we, do have, you want, we have... Do you want me to disagree with that? <laughs> Um, I do think we have more seats than we thought we would have in the House, so it'll be interesting to see, once they draw some of those lines, what actually happens, because I think we're going to lose some of those, particularly if it is a Republican year. You're um, talking statewide or national? Uh, statewide. statewide. Yeah. We do, we'll, well do the, statewide first. And then um, in, the, in the state Senate, I think it's a draw, you know, I, because we at least have the cushion of one, because we right. won the, the two when we only needed one. True. There is no way, whatever they redistrict, is going to be worse for Republicans. Uh, I believe what we have yeah, now is the most. You guys are at bottom. You're yeah, at bottom. there's no. There's. I believe it to be the most gerrymandered map uh, in America. I say that with all due respect. It. It. And I'm just. It cannot get any worse. It just cannot. That doesn't mean it's going to be all corrected, uh, um, but it. It will be. It will be a backlash year. I'm going to say. Uh, well. Any president's first midterm is usually pretty gruesome. Yeah. I believe Biden's is going to be extra gruesome. Uh, I tend to agree. I'm not supposed to Why? say that. Uh, well, they started off strong, really strong. Great approval ratings. They got the, you know, the first COVID package through, well, actually, which was the second COVID package. Um, and then you had left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing on vaccines, which is really confusing because we say it's about the science, but then we get different messaging about what we're supposed to be doing particularly around boosters, which I realize that's as of late. Um, it's kind of hard to look at that and not go, hmm, you know, even though this is my team. Uh, secondly, Afghanistan, it, how could that happen that way? I mean, it's one of three things. One, he got really, really good advice and just said, I'm going to ignore all of it. Two, the advice he got was actually real advice, but it was said in a way that it depends, you hear it how you want to hear it, and the third is they're just incompetent. My worry is it's number two. Because if it's number two, then what else is he hearing, although he's being told something? Um, and that's really frustrating. The, the other piece, I'll say this, and I will get in trouble for saying this one too, but it just seems like he has a lot of eggheads around him. You know, it's a lot of Ivy League, um, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of realism um, that's there. I'll say, so, I'll say it a little differently. Um, the Afghanistan debacle uh, was nothing short of sinful. You know, to, to see people clinging onto a side of a plane to their death uh, in order to get out, to leave our allies. I, I don't know who, who will ever help Americans again if we're in right. a foreign situation. After what we've done with, uh, in Vietnam, what we did here, it's just, it's, just, it's sinful. Um, and we all get that. But Afghanistan is not a pocketbook issue for Americans, even though it's been so right. expensive and, and it's been such right. a big deal. And it is ending a 20-year war. I mean, I, there is something to be said for that. We already ended a 20-year war. Let's, let's remember that before this debacle, there were 18 months without a single American dying in Afghanistan. And yeah, there were Americans in Afghanistan. There were Americans in Germany <laughs> after that war, and they're still there. Same thing in Japan. Yeah, and but in South Germany, Korea. in Germany, you don't expect conflict to happen. That it could happen. No, or as in Afghanistan, it could. Eighteen months without a single death. Give some some credit. There's. Um, well, that's good. And, you don't want anybody to die. Well, and let's also say <laughs> women had some rights. Uh, 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 during yeah. that time as well. Yeah, that's when I take stoked. a drink, so I don't have to answer that. Yeah, part. you go ahead and drink. All of that, but I'll add, Americans 
feel the loss of pride and the shame, the true shame of, of that. It sticks on Biden. It sticks on the Democrats. But it doesn't hit them in the pocketbook in a way that they see. Right. Whereas um, inflation, uh, which I know is just transitory, uh, no, it's not. I, I ran the numbers myself just the other day. Uh, since the beginning of uh, when Barack Obama was sworn in to today, the money supply has gone up over 150%. Uh, since the beginning of COVID, um, uh, March of last year, it's gone up 33%. And you know, I know it's old-fashioned to to to, to be uh, have this thought that money supply uh, okay. and, okay. and monetary okay. policy. Call Volker, I'll just call you Volker. Yeah, call me Volker. I would love to be called Volker. Um, um, I don't see inflation going away. I see it sticking. I look at Colorado, and I see many of the Democratic policies that hurt, uh, hurt employment. Uh, the war on oil and gas destroying an entire industry. Right. Uh, the Family Leave Act, which is going to destroy small businesses with a 1% uh, tax uh, on, on every employee. Um, uh, I see the, the paying people not to work while every other state that um, uh, stopped the $300 a, a week uh, extra saw unemployment. I'm seeing all these things that are starting to really affect the economy. And I think Colorado is going to be sluggish coming back. And the nation might be. I mean, for those of us old enough to remember stagflation, um, if that comes, there's only, there's only one team that's going to get uh, uh, hit right. by it. I think nationally we're going to take it in the shorts. We can talk about yeah. that, and I have a couple reasons why I think that. I think in the state, I'm not for sure it's going to sink in in time, if, assuming everything that you're saying is true. Um, you know, because it's... I think that's fair. You know, oil and gas gets a bad rap because in this state, they've stepped up. They stepped up with cleaner, clean jobs. They stepped up. We were the first state to regulate methane. You know, they've made a commitment to work around methane. And, you know, they're kind of taking it in the shorts in the current reconciliation bill. It's not they. Saying it's, 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 it's we. And, you know, but there needs to be a recognition about the number of jobs. I mean, it's like 340,000 jobs in Colorado. Uh, with that said, I don't, on family leave, I don't think that the impact of that, if it's going to have an impact, it's going to be after the election. And I think it's a, sell, I think it's a selling point uh, for Democrats here on the inflation piece. I don't think that it's going to be as visible here in Colorado. And you, there is an argument that it's transitory because of you know all the money that got put into the economy. The economy now has to kind of catch up with it. It's not necessarily going to be um, exactly what it is today. It's assuming that we have you know some level of growth. But it is difficult to argue that inflation doesn't exist because all you have to do is look around and compare prices from last year to this year. Totally get it. Um, so in Colorado, I'm not for sure it's going to affect us as much, other than I think we have some seats that we shouldn't have had. Um, I'm glad that we won them, but on the House side, just because it was such a good year for us. Nationally, I think it's a, it's a, different, it's, it's a different situation, and I think you know, Afghanistan it's, it's, right, take, isn't a pocketbook pocket issue. But put, put, put that aside for just a second. Let's, let's dwell in Colorado just for another second. Um, at the end of this year, beginning of next year, is when the family leave payroll tax pops in. That goes on top of many cities now that the governor signed a bill for local control, but that's only in one direction. It's only a local, if you go up, increase. It's, it's interesting in, how you guys always want local control until it's something you don't want. I find it interesting how you guys call local control something that only goes to more government. Local control means the locality can lower the minimum wage. Um, but telling the truth is not something you know, that this governor or God, your God team is good at. God forbid that the government actually, are, you know, is comprised of the people. It's not like some foreign entity. Yes, but if you're going to call something local control, should it not be local control? So under this governor, uh, cities can raise uh, minimum wage, can't lower it. Cities can outlaw tobacco and vape products or tax them differently, but not lower it. Can now do all sorts of uh, anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment stuff, but not reduce some of the ridiculous stuff the state, state has done. None of that is local control. All that is a local ratchet up to more government control. That's... That's you saying it's not local control because you don't like the fact that they can make things you know, how can, stricter. How can, it, that, how can a city, if you're in Lyman, uh, I was in La Vida the other day, and let's say there was low unemployment and they really want to lower the minimum wage from whatever it is today to a buck an hour lower. Should the people there 
the power of the people there have the ability to lower that. No, that there, rate. there there needs to be. A, I didn't ask there you. There needs to be a state no, standard. Hang on, hang on. on. So the answer yeah. is no. Just start off with a yes or no. The answer is no. 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 I'm glad I mean, you guys know better than the rest of us. Well, I mean, th think about federal law in terms of how um, federal law sets a basis, like in environmental law. If you want to do something stricter, you can do something stricter, but it has to meet a certain baseline. This is no different. It's not like this is a new concept in law and a new concept in government. So we shouldn't go, you know, run around and act like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening now. This isn't local control. This is not what we ever envisioned. You know, this kind of setting the base standard has, so when, has been around ever since I've been involved. So when states have a, a ban on same-sex marriage, but Boulder wants to start a uh, registry for uh, civil unions, which they did, which I thought was a pretty damn good idea, they, they, right. they, they should not start giving those same-sex benefits because we have a standard <laughs> on this side. If you want to play this game, I'll oh, play yeah. it. Oh, no, all no, I'm no, no, suggesting, no. Oh, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. all I'm well, suggesting yeah, yeah. is, no, I'll play this be game. honest. I'll play this game with be you. Be honest. Don't yeah. call it local control. But, but there's a difference on call the call it a ratchet. It's, it's different with marriage because that's constitutional. I mean, it, the Supreme Court has said you have a constitutional right to marry, so you couldn't do a ban if you wanted to. Before then, before then, there was a statewide ban against gay marriage. We passed an amendment to the Constitution of Colorado saying marriage can only be between one man and one woman. Uh, that is true, but it also went up to the Supreme Court. Yes, it did. My point being, I, I, see, simply, I see what you're saying. Simply, I see what you're the, saying. The falsehood that comes, you know, just call this local control. It is not uh, local control. So, and that's so what you're saying, it's a, like a local ratchet. That's what I've been saying for five minutes. <laughs> and if only the governor and the legislature See, would be honest enough. Sometimes it takes me a while, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Back to the local stuff uh, next year. Um, I think uh, because of these things, we still might see a real sluggish recovery here. Colorado used to have the best unemployment situation in the country, usually in the top three. Now we're in the bottom third. For a little while, we were number four to the bottom. Um, in this in this state, where people are still coming, right? You know, and the elect the uh, renewable mandates now, which are making electrical costs go crazy. Uh, property taxes are going skyrocketing. Uh, anyone who has a home or paying rent, you're you're feeling it. You know, the, these things they do take time, and you might be right. Uh, they might not all engage by 2022, yeah. but I'm going to tell you, Colorado is becoming much less friendly to small business, much less friendly to employers. Well, the other piece about this is, let's say some of this actually does start to hit. Um, I don't have that much confidence that your side would be able to use it in a way that it would actually hit us. This goes back to when you all go skeet shooting, you stand in a circle. We call that Caldera's first political axiom. <laughs> There's nothing Republicans can't screw up. We almost took away but our see, I own, don't know. We almost ended our primary. Um, uh, thank goodness the Central Committee of the Republican Party uh, took that away. Uh, Republicans, actually, I'm unaffiliated because I live in Boulder. There's no reason to be a Republican anymore. Um, one of three. One of three. Well, actually, this way I get to play in, in the Democrats' primary. You know, yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Like, you made a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I was ever a fan of open primaries. Yeah, I'm not a fan of open primaries either. Yeah. I, think, I, I, I think they're wrong. But to your point about Republicans giving it away, um, we have a tendency to put up in the general candidates who are just not palatable to a new demographic in Colorado. We do that all the time. Right. Well, you guys don't have a good system, and I'm not saying that we have a, a good one either. I think we have a better one. You have a great system. Finding, you have control of every lever of power. Uh, what? If, if only. You don't if, have if all only. four constitutional offices. You don't have the House. You but don't have the Senate. You don't have the courts. <laughs> well, we're, we're working on dog catchers. Yeah, um, there's, there's tax assessors. There's, yeah, there's there's um, still a coroner. There's a coroner down in Pueblo County that's a Republican. We're going to yeah. get that bastard. <laughs> I tell you. Um, well, I it I still think that we will do fine here. I think federally we won't, and I think the trend line here is not necessarily good for us because um, if if I were to put the yellow flag up as for um, what could start causing us problems and could cause us some problems with these upcoming primaries. 
uh, is the uh, presence of the Working Families Party. The fact that Working Families is now in Colorado, I mean, just as a general example in New York, because it's all Democratic, then you know, the parties start to splinter. And so the Working Families Party is a real party there. And they're, they've now landed that here. sure sounds like a communist party. And what you would call a communist. Um, they're just, what would you call they're, they're like the progressive of the progressives. And they may have a lot of things that I may personally agree with. I just think politically that's not palatable. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity here for business, and maybe even Republicans, but definitely for business, to play in primaries. You know, find some good candidates, play in some of these Democratic primaries. I think as Republicans... You'll do, you'll do more to change the mood yep. and what's going on at the state capitol by doing that than preaching and trying to get more... Are Repu you suggesting that businesses push to help the crazy communists win in the primaries no, so no, that no, they no, lose? No, oh, or? no, 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 no. Well, just so get more winnable Democrats? More winnable Democrats. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I'm looking for. More well, winnable. but the thing about it is, is that if, if Republicans aren't going to have their act together, and if the numbers in terms of where Colorado is right now, um, I would think that it would make sense, just being pragmatic, that you would want business-friendly Democrats. And the challenge you know, that I've seen when the business community gets involved you know, in races, they do one-offs. They'll pick like, you know, one particular candidate and say, well, we're going to help that one. You know, because there was a candidate this last cycle, or maybe the cycle before, where they bought network TV for them. You know, and this legislator is a great legislator, but you know, business had all these ideas about what that would mean for them, and they need a coordinated, thought-through plan that's multi-cycle. I know business is kind of like saying the gay community. It's it's a big conglomerate of lots of different people. Business here, because you know, we have little meetings and we plan I know. out. Everybody plan gets their agenda. Every guy. Yeah, you guys. You guys have it down. All right, but business is in free fall right now. A lot of businesses like oil and gas are hurting. Last year, go back to family leave, I really thought that business would step up and take care of this the way right. that they would in the past. I'm talking about the uh, Restaurant Association, the Chambers of Commerce, Casey, right. which is now called the Denver, Ch uh, the Colorado Chamber. You know, I, these are the guys, when that kind of threat comes, they usually mount up and dispatch it. They were AWOL, and that scares me. And let me add one other thing, which uh, will be good for your side. It's Donald Trump. Yeah. You're talking about your primaries. Let me talk about Republican primaries. There is a mood amongst hardcore conservatives that if you don't spout off and say the election was stolen and uh, uh, he is still the president and get that yeah. Trump vote, um, you you might have a real hard time winning a primary. However, if you say those things, I guarantee you, you will not win in any general. Uh, I, I agree with the latter. And I think on the family leave piece, um, I wouldn't say business was AWOL. I think that they got to a point where this is the best we can get. And why, why would we spend you know, millions of dollars to fight something that we're going to lose? And, and, and they were comparing what the legislative piece was and say, okay, that was really bad. Um, but they were so they able were to just keep outplayed. that from moving. They were just outplayed, which I, is... You know, I think it's good policy, so I'm not for sure it's outplayed. Policy. And I'm not sure it's outplayed, but... The I think, most lucrative, generous family leave. Well, but, but I'll but be also, able to take but, every Friday off. But think about all the initiatives that businesses put forward that have failed as of late, and there are probably folks who typically write the checks for those that are starting to say, you know, listen, this, this is a loser. You know, I'd rather go out and burn my money to keep warm than to put it into this campaign. It hurts the heart and blood of Colorado, which is small business. I think small business has taken it on the chin, particularly since the lockdowns, uh, government lockdowns That's from COVID. True. That's definitely and it, true. And it's been terrible. Talk to me about, about the Trump phenomenon. I want, to, I want to dive into this because I see this as a real issue that uh, if you don't say the election was stolen, and by the way, I think there was a lot of funny business with this, this election, but if you don't make it very clear this was stolen, there is a big chunk of the Republican base that sees you as a sellout and off you go. Right. I, and it's, it's, it worked. it's the only reason Gavin Newsom is still in office today, because instead of running against uh, his recall and the issues, he ran against Trump, right. you know, and, and, and what Elder, happened in Georgia. was no help either. Uh, uh, agreed in that if, 
if there was a Democrat leading or a squishy uh, Republican like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think we would have had a very different thing. But it, it was still the ghost of Trump. Right. That's what happened in Georgia, that you are voting for Trump. And that, you know, in a state like California and a state like Colorado, yeah. it's a kiss of death. Yeah, it's a am, gift. I, am I wrong? No, it's a gift that keeps on giving. You know, please continue to do that. Now, I, I will say it's troubling to me, very troubling, because it's corrosive to under, underlying confidence in the election, underlying confidence in our democracy. Um, and somebody, some folks have got somewhere to start standing up and say, it can't just be Liz Cheney um, that call some of this out. And I don't know how else you change this. I mean, changing institutions and funding different movements, I think it takes leadership. It takes you know prominent people who are willing to stand up it and start saying takes, it. Um, it, also, it takes, also takes you guys losing a little bit more. Oh, well, we'll be happy to do that for you. It also takes some reasonable Democrats to say, you know, there's serious concern, legitimate or not, about, uh, about elections. Where is the common ground? Where is the common ground that we can, we can talk about election integrity? I, I, I know. See, you, are, you can't even do it, but you won't recognize. No, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out where, where I could go. That is what you're asking me to do. And I'm having a difficult time. The, the one piece of the election that I will say that people can find troubling, I mean, I can understand why it happened and how it happened, but I can understand why you would be upset about it, and that is judges saying you have more time in order to count ballots. You know, judges saying, you know, you're going to keep things open a little bit longer. And, and there, there are some questions about that because, you know, state law is really clear. Federal law is really clear about who runs elections, right. and states do. Now, there's an argument that courts interpret what the law is, but the way they were interpreting it, you know, it, there's well, one thing to that. say that you have emergency power because of the pandemic. So, so that one I'll sort of give you. Do you, you honestly but the, believe? But the others, do, do you, you really think believe? that there's a lot of fraud with, with mail-in ballots? Come yes. on. Yes, like, oh, I'm sitting around and putting up ballots just, no. you know, as fast but, as I possibly can. But your side is much better at get out the vote, much better at getting ballots in, harvesting those ballots, and, and knocking on well, the doors. Listen, it's not my fault. My, my, it's not way, my fault we can run faster. Yeah, but let, let me concede this. Particularly in Colorado, Everything your side does to exploit mail-in ballots is something that Republicans could do as well. It's just that we don't want to do the hard work of uh, chasing voters, knocking on their doors, and uh, getting the ones out there. Where did want. this term harvest come from? I mean, it, it well, sounds like you're getting organs wait, from somebody. Wait a second. Harvesting, you didn't, harvesting ballots? You were the one something? who just went on for eight minutes about local control when it wasn't. <laughs> yes, you're harvesting the ballots. But go to a place like Pennsylvania where they are mailing them out um, um, for the first time ever. Don't tell me that there isn't all sorts of mischief that happens. I mean, I've gone to uh, 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 condominiums and apartments where the mail room, you just you could pick up the ballots. Out of there. So things like... Things okay, like, okay, so, hey, so let, let's, let's say we take two condominium complexes and you go in and they each have 100 units. Oh, wow, those 200 ballots are going to throw an election. I mean, the, the, the percentage of... The overall percentage of what that would represent is so small. All right, I don't so see, I don't going, see but, how. But going back to going back to and, and the thing wait, is, wait, is wait, that wait. you have the election officers are the ones sending out the ballots. So, so you're really t thinking that a secretary of state's in there, maybe the so you what, know, county clerk and what Mesa you are doing right are now, printing up ballots. You drink for a second. Let me talk. What <laughs> you are doing right now is exactly what I said, which is, yeah, you're right. We can't relitigate the last election. Otherwise, we're going to lose this election. But at the same time, when I said there just have to be some reasonable Democrats who go, you know what? If there is election fraud, even if it's this much, we ought to have some ways to take care of it. You're saying don't even do it. Let's just take photo ID. You know, I've been told that somehow photo ID is racist and wrong, but yet Democrats are the ones who are requiring photo ID and your, your vaccination passport to get into a bar. You know, I'm sorry. I don't see how, how, you, I, how, it, how photo ID I, I have is been, I have been convinced is racist. Idea. Really? I, it's, I don't think it's... One... I don't think it's... We, we can have this conversation, too. We can have the conversation about, you know, th you know put, putting up the race flag which will also get me in trouble, but you know, I have thoughts on that. But let's put aside that argument. I do think it's a little hypocritical for us. I think it's hypocritical for public officials to say we can't have, shouldn't have voter ID to vote, but you have to have a vaccination card 
and an ID in order to get into some like in New York in order to get into a restaurant. So that, when I when you, I said you can't you can't be honest with yourself so and say that back, that's not hypocritical. Going back when I said it would be nice to have some reasonable Democrats to have these conversations with, and you gave me the teenage daughter eye roll, like oh, there's nothing wrong with elections. <laughs> now you've, you've said no. Okay, but, but give, me, give me give me an example where we should have a conversation about something. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, listen, I'm always here. I'm always open to these kinds of conversations. I have more conservative friends than I do liberal, probably. Um, so I'm always open ears, but it's not clear to me exactly what you want to talk about other, than, you, other, I, other than your conclusion that there's fraud in mail-in ballots. I believe there is fraud in mail-in ballots. Anything that, you know, this is, this is the cornerstone of our democracy, and it's being thrown in the mail like grocery store coupons. I will say that Colorado's mail-in ballot system is probably among the tightest in the nation. Uh, but then we had 20 years to slowly work our way into, into these protections. The idea that I can't get a library card without um, uh, photo ID, but I can do same day voter registration, go in there, not be registered, be registered and pull the lever the same day and not have a photo ID. Yeah, is this, uh, can we find some common ground to say we should at least stop that? Uh, I wouldn't say stop that. Let's think about ways to make sure that that doesn't right. result in fraud. I, that conversation, let, let, I think we Let me we go back have. a little bit. And you've said this before, let me switch gears just slightly. I asked you before, what is the biggest threat to Democrats right now in this state? And you said hubris. And if looking at the last two sessions of what's gone on, if I haven't seen hubris, then I've never seen it in my life. I have never seen such arrogance amongst uh, the legislature and the governor's office in my 50 plus years in Colorado. Um, it, it, is, it is amazing to see. Will that cost them? I mean, we can go through the details. We can talk about there's no stock, uh, uh, stakeholder process anymore, how they're beating up on different industries, how they're going to, you know, trying to decide, punish employers if their employees decide to go to work by car. I mean, just, we can go into all sorts of things. Right. Um, and it is, it is hubris. But, but I wouldn't... What happened, what happened you're to confla old? You're conflating, or maybe equating, but at least conflating arrogance and hubris. And I'm not saying arrogance at all. Hubris is, you know, thinking that you can do more. That you know, there's this mandate that all these policies that you want to do, that because you won the election, the mandate is for all of that. I don't agree with that because I don't think that even even the Democratic primary electorate is as liberal as some people think. So I, I, agree. Do, I do think that 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 is a real threat, and it's like, how do you control some of that? And some of it I don't know. That's why I mentioned Working Families Party because that will you know fuel that. I think that there are some individual or individuals and organiza organizations on the progressive side who think that they played more in winning elections than they actually did. And that, that could create a real problem because there are people who are assuming, oh my God, I got elected because of them when they really didn't. And they're gonna be out saying things that they shouldn't and they could end up losing. Let me ask you this. The problem is money. Campaign finance reform, I think, was one of the worst decisions this state has made. And it meant, meant that people can't run their own campaigns unless right. you're wealthy. Well, we've got a governor who is very wealthy. And he put in close to $30 million that we can tell who knows what he put in in soft money. Last time around, he will do whatever it takes to, to stay in office. And um, whether Heidi is... What's with the teenage eye roll? <laughs> will he not I'll spend? Well, will he will he not spend all it takes yeah, to win? You're, how you're framing you're framing it in a way of, gee whiz, the only reason why he would ever win an election is because of his money. No, and, no, no. I'm because he's been an extraordinary governor. He ha he has walked this line. He has been the, the worst governor I have seen in oh, Colorado you know, give history. Me a break. Oh. Well, we, policy-wise, and I, I really like Jared. I've known Jared He's for, done an extraordinary job of walking of, the lines. Of I'm, closing down our businesses, of telling people oh, how to live. Think uh, about He was the first Democratic governor to start opening up the state, you know, during a pandemic. And, and he, that's, that's saying something. You know, he balanced that out. So let me see if I got to, this. To the he was a guy who sent liquor control thugs from Denver up to places like Loveland to beat poor uh, businesses into submission to close. Six, I forget how many thousands of, hundreds of thousands of business, uh, a quarter of those restaurants will never reopen. Uh, I thought it was belligerent. That, that, that's not because of the governor. That's not. It was his orders. 
Listen. Wait, who, whose orders were they? Listen, when you're protecting public health, there are certain oh. things that you... No, seriously, there's certain things you have to do. I mean, I, I tell you, as a, a small business owner, I would rather be in Colorado than Oregon. True, but don't give me this crap that that he's he's been walking this line. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen such a large lurch to the left in Colorado ever. From a policy point of view, from a policy point of view, what administration has moved Colorado's left-leaning agenda the furthest in two years, actually three years. Give me another governor. Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to compare because times in the 70s were different. Times when Romer was governor were different. The times when Ritter was governor were different. I mean, so all it's, those, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard all those to compare were Democrat. those all administrations those. with you know, an administration that's you know, primarily had a pandemic. You don't find, you don't find, I mean, mind you. And, and quite frankly, I'm glad there's a move to the left on some of this. Yes, you, you work for that team. Uh, I work for Team Freedom, and I'm seeing attacks on gun rights. I'm seeing attacks on relationships. I'm seeing attacks on small uh, business owners. I'm seeing huge attacks on oil and gas and other industries. Right. I'm seeing attacks on ranchers. I'm seeing more. Well, I will, I will say this. I think it would be smart politically if Democrats would look at certain industries and start saying, we need to work you know, together better. You know, they, they need, no, they, seriously. They don't work they, together. They are, I mean, things that they can do together and you know, recognize the contributions that they make. The agriculture sector. I mean, it, there's a lot more we could be doing for farming. The oil and gas sector. I mean, how much more can you Your beat up on them? Your team is destroying that. Prop, uh, excuse me, uh, Prop 112 was, um, uh, was defeated, yet Senate bill, I think it was 181, I'm trying to remember, right. was in many ways worse. And it is a one-way garret against, well, against oil I, and gas. I mean, one, tell, one, 181, you know, from an oil and gas perspective, I know a lot of people thought it was awful. It could have been a lot worse. No, it could have been a lot worse. And so, I mean, there was some industry that was Hitler involved. Hitler could have actually invaded oh, Austria. Uh, Instead, uh, he just annexed it. It could have been worse. It would have been. And, and many How of them would smartly, it have been if so many of them smart, there, there were members of the they industry that They didn't have to do anything. Up. We already had the most restrictive oil and gas regulations in the nation before 181. Did we not? Uh, probably, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The answer is I, yes. yes. Yeah. There I it agree. is. No. And so we did not need to do anything, especially when the people directly spoke, we do not want um, more restrictions on oil and gas, and they shot down 112. And instead now, now okay, it, they shot it down. Yeah, they shot down 112, but 112 was an overreach. 112 didn't have the support of the mainstream environmental community. Um, the 112 got blown, mm. from and my 181, perspective, got blown out of proportion in terms of what it was. 181, which gives, again, local authorities the ability to ratchet up um, uh, oil and gas regulations but not necessarily to lower them past that. No, I and that. an oil and gas, it was and an oil with and gas with administra- uh, 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 board now, uh, the commission, which is packed with people who dislike oil and gas. You know, the governor not only signs bad bills, but the people he's put into his appointed positions, including the veterinary board. You have a vicious... Yeah, I'm doing the teenage girl yeah, eye roll again. Yeah. The, a vicious anti-meat... Uh, um, person on the uh, veterinary board. This people, these people look after all the cattle. It's her sworn uh, mission in life to make eating meat illegal. Uh, when you put that woman on uh, the the uh, veterinary board, you can't say that you're there doing good things for for rural Colorado. Right. This is why I, I will I will go hours will. with you toe to toe that this is not the most progressive. Most well, shift, the greatest well, shift listen, to the left I've, told you, I've ever seen in Colorado. I think it's great that it's progressive. I think it's great that it's one that of we're the, shutting down our the most progressive. I'm totally there. My concern is a pragmatic one, a political one, and that is to be smart about how far we go and, you know, and where we go. You know, on the veterinary board, first of all, one, I don't know if she's completely you know, against all meat. She Who is. Knows? Why not have a voice like that on the veterinary board? I mean, is, because, is the board made up of that? No. Because when you have people in the industry 
on those boards. They understand what goes on in ranching. Yeah, you know, I, listen, I grew up on a farm and ranch, so I, I should be agreeing with so, you. So, so I'm there, you know, I'm there. But the, when I say that I'm just, have, I'm just getting in this like mode of arguing with you. And this, so don't, don't tell me that he's walked this wonderful fine line, you know. Uh, but he finished, has. I'm not saying he's not gonna get reelected, his numbers, are, his approval numbers are good. He is a remarkably skilled politician. I mean, He's fast, th think, fast think on about his it. Feet. The, w the way I've always viewed the governor, viewed Jared, is he's first an entrepreneur, second a market disruptor, looking for things. It's like some things need to be turned upside down a little bit because change can be good, and third a Democrat. And it, thank God, I thank God we have one and two because a guy, there's a lot of creative thinking going on. Somebody who really pays attention thinks through this, talks through it, he's in the weeds on a lot of things. I mean, I think it's good. So let me make an observation. Um, uh, this goes back to the blueprint. When um, a bunch of guys uh, that you know well, Tim Gill, Pat Stryker, Rep Bridges, and Polis decide to pull together the money, mostly to, to get gay marriage, but to bring the left together, um, Stop eye rolling. Eye rolling. I've got a ten. I've got a teenager. It's a, I see it <laughs> when you're doing it behind my head. Um, I, I look at those those funders. I go, what what do those funders have in common? Um, and it pops out that they all made their money in pretty fast order. Uh, Jared made his money um, uh, online uh, with uh, uh, credit with a greeting card company, but in tech. Uh, Tim Gill through a, a software program, Rut Bridges through a, a measuring program, uh, and uh, Pat Stryker made it fast the old-fashioned way. She inherited it. When I look at the, uh, the funders for the conservative side, not only do they not give nearly the same amount of zeros afterwards, but they built buildings and went through, uh, they, they did oil and gas, which is very regulated. They did developing very regulated. They did, they brewed beer, which got, you know, so they've got government all over them. And I think it also changes the mindset that people who have built brick and mortar businesses, not tech businesses, are not going to relate to oil and gas and ranching and farming and all these other heavily regulated uh, industries in Colorado that are so disconnected from the, the, the people who've made their money this way. And so that character of Colorado where people worked with their hands and they've earned it and they saw what government limits them uh, to do and the, how much money they have to put towards compliance, um, uh, there's a real difference in those, those funders. And I think it's now showing in what those funders bought so many years ago, which they're now cashing in today in policy changes. So one, I can't... Tell, tell, tell me what, first okay, of all, yeah, tell my, me what you thought about that observation. Okay, one, one I think is too simplistic. It is very simplistic. And I, I have to state that I can't speak for any of those funders, but outside looking in... But you somewhat, know them all pretty well. Um, that's assuming that there was a mindset and these are the policies that we want to have happen and this is why we want to invest. And that wasn't the case. It was just about winning, and Democrats winning. And once Democrats get in, we trust the system and you know the folks that are okay. elected to make the decisions they want to. The one, the reason why I say it's really too simplistic is it wasn't just individuals. There were a lot of institutions that put money into this. There were a lot of other organizations that put money into and effort and planning Agreed. and you know putting people Agreed. on the ground. Agreed. But those four individuals, you know, if, by, it, if you guys want to, if you guys, uh, Republicans want to think, oh, if we get five donors and get them together, we're going to take power no, back, no. I say, hey, go for it, because you're going right. to lose. But will you admit that what those four mega donors did, to their credit and to their uh, strategy, which you had a large part to do with, Al Yates had a large part to do with, um, uh, what that did is it it, it caused a gravitational pull for all the other interests, whether it's the environmentalists, uh, uh, SEIU, other unions, trial well, I lawyers. This, I that. can see that. And it, and it brought, it brought, it forced a collaboration that really wasn't existing. Okay, I, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I have to push back on one thing, and that is they worked really hard. I'm not saying they didn't work really hard. You know, I'm when saying you say they, they made they their like money use their hands. quickly. Um, no, some of them didn't. Some of them didn't. It took, but when it, it took like. Get my, get my larger point. I get the larger, larger point. Larger point was when the tech ship comes in. The tech ship comes in. When Jared sold um, um, his greeting card company for a reported $800 million, I'm on you a lot of that was right. stock, uh, 
Uh, that's a ship that comes in in one huge big wave. Uh, you know, you think about the guys at Facebook, you know, they make it in a huge wave. I'm not saying they didn't work hard, but they also didn't have to go through the, um, through the compliance issues the way see, that's I don't, what I, that, that, they, that, they didn't have to, they didn't have to fight with that, their that local makes, zoning. That makes an assumption that, assuming all that's true, that, that assumes that that affects how policy happens, and it doesn't. It's completely removed from it, completely removed. No, I'm not saying how policy happens. They try it a third time. I think <laughs> that the funders for the left tend to be more uh, uh, progressive because their money came in not through highly regulated industries at first. Their big ships didn't come through by... Uh, uh, dealing with agriculture and uh, building and zoning codes and OSHA regulations. And, uh, I agree with the latter. I don't agree with the former because it assumes that they have a, you know, a policy, a political agenda, and they didn't. No, I'm saying that their, their life experience does not have the same appreciation that oil and gas guys who are out there throwing chains at a, yeah, uh, on it. I, they I don't have that. the same appreciation. Um, um, and I, I think it's part of the reason why, going back to Trump, that Trump was able to reach into that area that was traditionally democratic, which is guys, blue collar guys who work in the private sector with their hands. Uh, you know, something that, that Democrats thought they had. And I think the new hard edged progressives, I'll call them socialists, you can call them whatever, are really turning off, uh, you know, the faith winners of the world are going to be turning off those, uh, the guys who, who, who make pipe down in Pueblo. So, the one point I would just tweak that I would do on the Trump voter piece is I think that it was more just frustration uh, with the system and with institutions and saying, you know, a pox on all your houses, I can't stand this, I want somebody to turn the thing upside down. I think it was a large part of that. Um, the second piece is I don't, I don't think that the socialism that you see or liberalism that you see has soaked in enough, assuming that it's the bad that you say it is, in order to really have an effect within the election. I think you might be right on that. Over time, um, these policies take time to happen. So it's really easy to put in uh, Senate Bill 181 to screw with uh, oil and gas. But a decade later, you're right. going to really see what, what that does. Well, what's, fr what's frustrating about that is you have established industries that get attacked. Um, and I can understand why you would see that as a problem, because the attacks are coming from folks that have really no connection to it and don't appreciate everything that they've provided. Which you know, is, for example, the oil and gas, you know, the money they provide for schools, the money they provide for police, special districts, firefighters. Well, by the way, our lights are on here because they make us fuel, and my car goes because they give us fuel. Well, we also have lights on because of renewable energy, because and over the, time we'll the very have more expensive of that. Mandates. And there needs to be, there needs to be a balance, um, but we can't say that it's not going to happen. I mean, come on. I tell you what, you get rid of the cronyism in uh, environmentalism, and we'll talk. <laughs> all right, uh, you give me, you, you, you take care of all the regulations, credits, mandates, and, and then I'm agnostic when it comes to uh, fuel. I don't care. I just don't want the government picking winners and losers, which is exactly what, what we're doing. So you want an even playing field on that? I'll play all day long. <laughs> hey, let me ask you about personalities. Um, you seem to think that you know, Jared's money is, is not going to be a factor. It's going to be a big factor. What will I'm not saying it's not going to be a factor. It'll be a factor, but people just assume that's the only reason why it wins, no, which no, isn't no, true. No, no, I agree. I, let, let me concede that fully. Uh, but that being said, when uh, a Republican candidate has to ask people for $2,000 maximum or whatever it is, I think it's, it might be 2400 now, but that's the most you can get from somebody. Right. You have to ask you know, 100,000 people and get yeses for the full amount for what Jared can do in, right. like this. Which means that Jared can spend all that rest of the time winning an election and not begging for money. It's, it's unfair. And it's kind of interesting that the left that hates rich guys so much uh, um, right. rallies around it's, these rich guys like Tom Steyer and, and Jared Polis. What would it take for you know, a Tom Democrat? Tom Steyer has been so successful in, in, in politics. Yep. I roll. Yes, but he's certainly been able to put the zeros behind oh, it. And definitely, also, definitely. also a guy who made his money pretty quickly. He didn't, 
he didn't uh, he didn't build a business where he got his hands dirty. He invested and got some okay, really I good stuff. I interrupted you, so I'll let you finish your point. What's it going to take for a Republican to beat? Let's go with Jared first, and then I want to talk about uh, Michael Bennett. Um, well, the is, it, is it even in the realm of possibility no, from your point of view? No, I don't think it is. I mean, we got to, you know we have to run as if it can happen. Um, but my criticism of the Republican approach to how they've dealt with, you know, dealt with Jared, and thank God they did it this way, they didn't take any shots at him. You know, there wasn't a coordinated campaign just to keep you know, trying to do some cuts here and there and start to bleed him so something could possibly open up. You know, you had Republicans standing up and saying, and I'm thankful that they did, but standing up and saying, geez, you know, I think he's doing a good job here, and we're glad that we're seeing this there. You know, there needed to be a campaign somewhere, and thank God there isn't, um, that went after him. So I think it's a, going back on, a steep hill. Now, on the campaign well, finance piece, I'm with you on campaign stop, finance. Stop there for a second. Take the compliment. Um, this is what our team does so poorly. We think in terms of the next election. Um, and we think about the terms of the next year. Sometimes it's just as much as the next nine weeks. Uh, whereas to do what you're talking about means a coordinated effort from day one that he's sworn in. You build up stories. You build up the narratives. I think the left is superb at this. I think uh, the right is, for the most part, really bad at it. So um, a credit to you, my progressive overlord. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what else would it take? So... Um, Starting right now, a year before the, the election really kicks in, we've got a year to go, what would it take for a Republican, and is, do you have a name that could beat Jared Polis if, if inflation stays high, if unemployment stays... Eh. Uh, I don't know who that would be. I mean, I, I think... Does Heidi all have a shot? Uh, Heidi's really nice, but I don't think so. I mean, my two words when I got called and asked about it was good luck. Um, I do think, though, you need to figure out the right and Trump voters and how they're thinking and what they're saying and conservatives and find someone that isn't a wackadoo um, to be someone that they listen to. You know, and somebody that I've always liked, I disagree with him a lot, is Dave Williams. You know, because he can talk that, he can walk that, but he's also hard not to like. Um, and there's, you know, some intelligence there. He's smart and understands how to play some of the politics. I don't know. I don't know the, the intersisting stuff also, that happens within he you know, also your was side the of the one who wanted to end the uh, oh, Republican I know. primary. Well, and can we agree that 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 would have been Harry Carey? Yeah. yeah. All right. Talk to me about Michael Bennett. Uh, I again, I believe the uh, luckiest politician in American history. Uh, uh, because he's one of the best in American history. No, because Republicans keep putting up candidates that don't have a shot at winning a general election in Colorado. Well, again, that goes back to the skeet shooting right. and standing That doesn't in make him one of the best. It makes him one of the well, no, luckiest. Well, okay, no, let's put, let's put aside the politics. Look what he's been able to achieve, you know, and the voice that he is in the Senate. I mean, it is a breath of fresh air. No, I, okay, now you're doing the 13-year-old right, viral. Wait, wait a second. I don't see him talking about the incredible problems with uh, expanded... Uh, uh, unemployment. I don't see him talking about this $5 trillion uh, uh, bit of uh, uh, overkill, putting our kids into debt. I don't see him standing up demanding justice for uh, Afghanistan. I, no, I'm sorry. He, he, and, he and Hickenlooper both refuse to stand up to the liberal wing of the party. I have one response to all of that. Taking child poverty and decreasing it by 50%. By putting, is that bad? Is that bad? So, so you think yes, we should have people, you know, kids in poverty? Oh, really? You're, you're going to try to do it that way? <laughs> really? Really? Yes. So let me just re re shoot it back. So oh, you think go. it's okay to put your grandchildren into massive debt they cannot repay? Oh, really? For welfare so today. the tax cut that you all you all supported and said the pay for is going to be from economic growth. Economic which, growth, which was happening which quite didn't. well. Which didn't. Oh my gosh, it, you, it didn't even come close. The net right, cost can, can was we, still 2.3 3 trillion. And what right. you're doing, what you're doing to us for this package, us? which I think is too big, I think it's too big, is we have yeah. to tax. We have to find all kinds of fees and taxes in order to pay this? for it. We would can't you say join because me? you spend all this money would you and people are more productive, we, the economy Because you keep grows. saying we should have a conversation. Can we have a conversation about having a balanced budget that government, including the federal level, can't do, uh, has to, uh, can't do debt spending. 
I would love. To, by the way, I would Republicans, love, I would Republicans love, I would are just have that conversation. I would love to have that conversation. I mean, let me make it very clear. Republicans are great Republicans when they're in the minority. When they're in the majority, they too like to do debt spending. As I mentioned, we have... And not find any way to pay for it other right. than this magical growth that's going to happen. Well, and you can't tax your way to prosperity either. When the money supply goes up by 150% since Obama, you know, you are teetering on something that could be economically devastating. Our money is faith-based. There is no commodity behind it. Right. And now it's being printed. And you want to add another $5 trillion to it? Uh, no, I get, that's, that's dang, I get that's that concern. I get that concern. I don't think the solution to that, though, is to say that you can't do deficit spending. I think because, you, because the the confidence in the American com economy, the confidence in the dollar is really important. So you're going to have, you know, times that you need to be able to do that because it's really a calculation of, you know, debt to GDP, and we're I not think, at, we're not at a point to debt to I GDP think, or the def deficit to GDP that it's bad. It ha it's worse than World War II. Oh, gee whiz. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, what, gee whiz? What is, what, is, what is the standard for currency around the world still today? The dollar. Soon to be the yuan, and hopefully Bitcoin at some point. But hang on a second. But, you know, this is not so bad. It's, it's not that bad. It is worse than the worst it has ever been when there was truly an existential threat to, to America. To Let me finish the thought. Let me finish the thought. Okay. Let me finish the thought. World War II was truly an existential threat to the United States. It wasn't a virus. It wasn't COVID. It was, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't an invasion. It was an invasion we were fighting off. This was it. And by the way, to go up to now higher than that level, do you really believe that we are now in a, a situation that is more dangerous than World War II today? Uh, 600,000 people dying? I would say that that's a serious 600, problem. 600,000 people you dying is serious. How many of them would have died anyway, given their age? Um, oh, give oh, Stop me. the rolling the eyes. Give me is, a do, break. do you go to like, oh, so, so, this progressive so, so, school, so do they okay. do this? So it's okay if a few hundred thousand people die. Right. So what I see is what I like to call the liberal two-step. What I want to talk about is the amount of debt that we have, which is now higher than it's ever been, higher than World War II, and you brushed it off. So when you said okay, it's not I, that I, bad, I do want, I can't do want you say, say, can't you say that it is bad? The last president that didn't have deficit spending that we were in the black was, oh, gee whiz, a Democrat. Was a Democrat. Fine. I will gladly say that. Thanks to Republicans beating him into welfare reform, among many other things. But this is not a part welfare of... Stop reform. with the... Well, bringing it to the states, which is what we should do with many other things. So... I'm going to pull you back from the two-step. Okay. You said this <laughs> debt wasn't that bad. I'm giving you a chance okay, to look at I, your grandchildren's right, right, grandchildren right. because they'll look at this I've, I've and over, apologize I've to over, them in no, advance. I've overstated it. it. It is the worst that it's ever been, and something has to be oh, done about it. it. I'm, I'm this there. That's why it's so difficult talking it. to a progressive because you've got to spend 15 minutes to get back to the first point you made, and you oh, can't get it, away. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't hear what you want to hear. Debt, debt for a country that doesn't die isn't necessarily bad. It's a question of how much debt you have. And for what reason? I wouldn't mind an amendment that said you can go into debt during war. I get that. Uh, of course, if we did oh, so, that... But if you have a pandemic and you have 300,000 people die, you can't do it for that. This was less than the Spanish flu, and somehow oh, we didn't do that. that is not true. Percentage-wise, absolutely. In terms of numbers, it's not. Uh, per, per capita, absolutely. Absolutely, the ratio of people who died in that. Absolutely, not the ratio, the number of people. Oh, the number. Yes, that's true because we, we well, had half the size. Because gee people. whiz, you know, you know, a hundred years later, we're not going to have more people. Yeah. Of course, we are. So you'd rather look at it in hard numbers rather than per, per capita. That's the arguing technique we're yeah, using. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking. I'm taking. Are you going to stick with that one? I'm going to stick with that. All one. right, we'll do that. All right, we've been. You're almost finished with your drink here. You didn't answer my question on Bennett. Okay. You. Is he at all vulnerable? Um, I, should, I, I should say yes, so they, you, know, you run like you're going to lose, but he's going to be very difficult to beat. My, my question is, who are you going to run? You that know, is the I, question. What would that person, if, if someone were to run, draw him up or her up, what would that person look like who could win, both for governor and United States Senate in Colorado? Uh, if, 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 somebody that can drive the conservative base in a way that, you know, the unaffiliated voters, suburban voters, don't get completely offended. 
are our parties because you got you got to start switch you got to start pulling on affiliate. I mean, it's this is you know well, it's, so, not, well, it's not same, rocket science. Same thing on your side, and if, if and I don't know if that person exists because that's 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 a tough that's a tough yeah. one. But in the same way, the hardcore Trumpies uh, will not pull in unaffiliated or, or moderate swing voters. But the don't, socialists don't have, don't aren't going to do it either. They don't have to be a hardcore Trumpy, just that those Trumpies will actually listen to it and say, well, you know, hey, maybe that's okay, rather than have no. You, have you met us Trumpies? Uh, yeah, well, I kind of live with one, so. <laughs> one of the best that's, marriages that's, ever, that's, by the way. That's, that's a whole other story, but. That'll be for the, for the next. Hey, thanks so much. This is always a kick. But you know, his show, Greg Gutfeld. Yes. Nine o'clock. Here in the mountain region, so on, I've never on Fox it. News. That's the only time I've ever started watching Fox News. So really, me, I know watching Fox News faint. For those who it's don't a great know, show. It's your, a great show. your husband Arash is working for uh, Gutfeld. Yeah, senior producer. Yeah, that is pretty awesome. Gotta love it. Makes for interesting times at home. I yeah. can tell you that. <laughs> Always is. Hey, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Absolutely. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.